All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, and thank you so much for being here with us today. I hope you're enjoying the very beautiful day we're having in New York City. Uh, my name is Sophie Lowe, and I'm the Director of Visitor Services and Program Management at the Museum at Eldridge Street. And I want to thank everyone so much for joining us for tonight's program, Activism, Athletics, uh, and Advice, Immigrant Newspapers of New York City. We are so honored to be collaborating on this program with our partners, the Forward and the Museum of Chinese in America, MOCA, and we thank them so much for working together on this program with us. And um, of course, we'd also like to thank our wonderful audience members for being here with us today. We'd also like to especially thank Hannah Pollock and her entire team at the Forward for the many years of partnership together, uh, and especially on their work with us on our exhibition, Pressed Images from the Jewish Daily Forward, which has been on view at Eldridge Street since October 2019. The museum at Eldridge Street has been closed since March 2020, but we are thrilled to be announcing our reopening on June 1st. So you can learn more about this on our website. And uh, on our website, you'll also find information about our other virtual programs, Lori Sidewalking Tours, and our signature Egg Rolls, Egg Creams, and Empanadas Festival, which will be taking place virtually this year. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to be introducing our archivist and curator at Eldridge Street, Nancy Johnson, who's going to be moderating the conversation this evening. But a couple of housekeeping notes beforehand. This conversation is being recorded and we are offering closed captioning, which is being powered by AI. And this means that there's going to be some typos in the captioning throughout. So just thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Uh, you can turn this feature on or off by clicking on the CC closed captioning button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And throughout the program, we encourage you to ask questions uh, via the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can by the, by the end of the program. Now, I am so delighted to turn things over to our curator and archivist, Nancy Johnson. Nancy has been curating the museum's temporary art and history exhibition series since it began in 2016. And as the museum's archivist, she looks after our historic documents, objects, and art collection. And some favorite project of hers since coming to Eldridge Street in 2009 include editing Beyond the Facade, an illustrated history of the Eldridge Street Synagogue and its restoration, uh, and developing the permanent exhibition in 2014, along with curating exhibitions ranging from the art of Kiki Smith to Harbin, China, past, present, combining both history and contemporary art. Nancy, please unmute yourself, turn on your video, and please take it away. Uh, thank you, Sophie, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, before I introduce our participants this evening, I'd like to say a few words about that exhibition that led us here to have this program tonight. Uh, a few years ago, one of my colleagues at the museum at Eldridge Street suggested that the Forward newspaper might make a good subject for an exhibition. Why, you might ask? Well, because the Forward has been part of the Eldridge Street story and the American Jewish experience since it began printing in 1897. And that was just 10 years after the museum's landmark synagogue home opened its doors. For many years, the newspaper's towering headquarters was on East Broadway, just a few blocks away. And the earliest Eldridge Street congregants were Yiddish speaking immigrants from Eastern Europe and were among the forward's many readers. And since that time, many generations of their descendants have continued to be devoted forward readers. We figured that an exhibition focused on this newspaper might help us understand what the men and women who made up the Eldridge Street community were thinking and talking about. So when I proposed the idea of a joint venture to the forward's archivist, Hannah Pollock, who you'll meet in just a minute, she had the inspired idea to focus our exhibition on vintage photographic plates from the Forward's archive. These metal plates were used to print photos in the paper in the pre-digital age between about the 1920s and the 1960s. 
upon his vast knowledge of forward history and content was essential in developing the exhibition as we looked at what these images might tell us about Jewish life on the Lower East Side in New York City and around the world. The resulting exhibition, as Sophie mentioned, is pressed images from the Jewish Daily Forward. And it was slated to come down last April uh, and move on to the Yiddish Book Center. But like so many things in this past year, the, slows, the show's closing was interrupted by the pandemic. And so when we realized that press would still be on view when we reopen in June, we thought it would be fun and interesting to have another look at the show from another point of view. Sophie had the great idea to get in touch with our friends at the Museum of Chinese in America, suggesting that we have a conversation focused on immigrant newspapers published on the Lower East Side. Through the MOCA archive, we hope to look at our neighboring community in Chinatown to add context and comparison to the view we gained from the forward. Would there be similarities, differences, interesting parallels? These are some of the questions that bring us here tonight. We will explore both the forward and MOCA archives with their archivists and see what that tells us about immigrant life on the Lower East Side. So uh, let's get to it. First, I'd like to introduce Hannah Pollock, who has been the archivist at the forward for slightly more than two decades. In that role, she oversees a vast collection of photographs metal press plates, news articles in both Yiddish and English, as well as printing artifacts and other ephemera. Hannah provides research and translation and also writes original content for the paper, often searching back to see what the forward had to say about a subject that is once again in the news. Lately, she's been working with Urban Archive on a digital mapping project of images from the forward's archives you can check that out at urbanarchive.org. Uh, and a new feature, Ask the Archivist, will soon debut on the Forward's website. In addition to having the benefit of Hannah's expertise today, we are happy to welcome a new friend and colleague, Yue Ma. She has been with MOCA for 14 years and is in charge of the museum's collections, library, and archives. In this role, she oversees acquisition, preservation, conservation, research and digital projects at MOCA's new Collections and Research Center, which is located at 3 Howard Street. UA assisted, <clears throat> excuse me, with MOCA's permanent exhibition, which is entitled With a Single Step, and recently co-curated the exhibition Waves of Identity, 35 Years of Archiving. I think it's safe to say that the uh, perspectives that UA and Hannah will offer tonight will give us a new and more complete understanding of our Lower East Side neighborhood, but they can certainly tell you much better than I. So let's begin. First, we'll hear from Hannah, followed by UA. Hannah, you're up. Unmute yourself, Hannah. Uh, Hannah, you just have to unmute yourself real quick. You're still Okay, muted. great. Got it. Got it. There Sorry, I go. didn't, the controls disappeared for a second. Hi, everybody. <laughs> no <laughs> Good evening. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm the archivist for The Forward. Thank you for that beautiful um, introduction. And um, uh, I, like Nancy said, I'm the archivist of The Forward. Uh, the Forward, for those of you who don't know, uh, founded in New York City in 1897. The 124-year-old Forward was a socialist daily newspaper published in Yiddish, which was the main language of Eastern European Jews. The Forward's founding editor was novelist and journalist uh, Abraham Kahn. Uh, today, we're forward.com, we're digital only, still publishing, 
online, and we remain the sole independent American Jewish media outlet in English and still in Yiddish. And like Nancy said, the Forward's archives are made up mostly of the paper's photographic morgue, the photos we published, some business and editorial records, and the technical materials related to the process of printing a paper, such as the photo engraved metal press plates Nancy talked about, and uh, these beautiful curation you can see in the show Press at Eldridge. And, um, I am thrilled to be in like virtual shared space uh, with both MOCA and Eldridge, knowing that all of our organizations existed in the neighborhood. Um, by 1911, with circulation topping 100,000 daily for the forward, they built a 10-story building at 175 East Broadway, which you can see here. And uh, this picture was published in our paper in 1911 with the announcement of the fact that we were going to build this building. Now, the building was open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it was considered the address of the Jewish people, which in the beginning literally meant you could have your mail sent to the building as if it was your personal post office box, and the forward published news of your mail's arrival in a feature called Briefkasten, meaning post boxes. And just uh, a strange aside, um, the day they actually broke ground for the building, a geyser gushed up, a geyser of water gushed up at 175 East Broadway. And as you can see in the front page picture, people came from all over the neighborhood. You know, most people didn't have running water back in those days, right? 1911 on the Lower East Side in tenements. And so it was just like a thrilling experience. And it almost was a harbinger of some kind of miracle that was going to happen with this paper. Eventually, with everybody dropping by the forward building for advice and picking up their mail there, our founding editor, Ab Khan, decided that real life was in fact more interesting than a novel. And so he started a feature column in our paper, which you can see here, uh, publishing these letters and questions. Whoops, can we go back one slide? Um, thank you. Um, and started a feature column publishing the letters and the questions that the forward was receiving, asking for advice. And that's how we came to have our advice column known as the Bintel Brief, uh, meaning a bundle of letters. And you're looking at the slide is actually the first one we published in 1906. So here's uh, Abraham Khan himself from his memoirs about the very first letter we published in the Bintel Brief from a resident of Eldridge Street. So here's Ab Khan. I had always wished that the forwards would receive stories from daily life that weren't written at a desk, but rather in the tenements and factories and cafes, everywhere that life was the author of the drama. One day in January 1906, my secretary, Leon Gottlieb, told me about three letters we received that weren't suited for any particular department. Let's print them together, I said, and call it a Bintel Brief. The first letter was from a woman from Eldridge Street who wanted to use the forward in order to appeal to her neighbor to return a watch. Once, when she had to leave the house, the neighbor had agreed to keep an eye on her house. But when she returned home, she noticed that the watch was missing. It soon became apparent to her that it was in a pawn shop. She didn't think her neighbor was a thief, but she suspected the neighbor of pawning the watch since her husband was out of work and the family was in extreme need. In her letter to the forwards, the woman wrote that she understood her neighbor's situation and she felt her pain, but she feared that her own husband would also soon lose his job and she too would have to frequent the pawn shop. Also, if her neighbor would agree to give her the pawn ticket for the item back, she'd be perfectly willing to pretend that nothing had happened. Her neighbor could simply leave the ticket anywhere around the house, she'd soon find it. In her letter, she invited the neighbor to come over again, assuring her that she was always a welcome guest. So that's an example. That's our first letter that we ran in the Bintel Brief. But the Bintel Brief advice column ran for over eight decades, covering every imaginable trouble plaguing new Jewish Americans, new immigrants. And it's still so relevant that it's, it's still running now. And uh, you're encouraged to write to the forward Bintel Brief feature for advice today. It'd be interesting to see uh, how we do. Uh, next slide. Okay, thanks. Um, over the years, the forward covered a variety of sports, though, as you may suspect, not our biggest feature. And you can see some of the evolution of our coverage with these photos from our archive. Here we're covering boxing. This is uh, Herbie Kronowitz. He was a famous boxer from Coney Island neighborhood in the 40s. 
Um, we covered chess. Uh, this is actually a picture. It looks like checkers. These are kids on the Lower East Side playing checkers. Um, chess was important to our, our readership. Uh, we covered uh, local sports events. Here is a photograph of a group of um, track and field um, uh, athletes at a union event. Might have been May Day or Labor Day. Those were typical days that would feature um, sporting events, maybe on Randall's Island. And with the arrival of immigrant athletes in the 30s who were escaping fascism, um, this is an example of Erno Schwartz. He's one of the greats in soccer. He came to New York to play an exhibition game in the 30s with a group from Hakloch. Um, and he ended up staying because of course the war broke out and many of them were with the rise of fascism, we're, we're not allowed to play on any uh, leagues or teams in Europe anyway, so they formed their own Jewish um, sports association called Hakoach, and they came to America, and people like Erno ended up staying here, and we covered that, and this is the Brooklyn Wanderers, a local soccer team too, also composed of many of the, you know, exiled uh, um, athletes. Um, the paper covered uh, some of the Olympics, um, we definitely covered baseball, football, tennis, mostly when a Jewish player was hired on the team. And of course, uh, whoops, sorry, can we go back a second? I went too fast. And, um, you know, as the uh, community was growing in the 50s and becoming more prosperous and also leaving the urban centers, we eventually published a column called Yidin Hoppen Fish, Jews Go Fishing or Jews Catch fish, which I think is emblematic of the fact too, of the um, sort of movement of people to be able to afford taking a vacation and um, of going upstate to the Catskills most likely. This is an image of uh, Jim Braddock, who was um, a boxing celebrity and he's on the Lower East Side with the kids. You can tell it's like the 50s, sort of um, encouraging them in their athleticism. And um, the forward's role in supporting social justice historically is well known. Here on the first page, you can see reporting both foreign on the right side, it's Bravo Cubaners. It's our, this is our first uh, inaugural edition and we're celebrating the uh, Cuban rise, Cubans rising up against the Spanish colonizers. And also local here on this side um, is the neighborhood um, struggle between doctors and pharmacists back in the day. Pharmacists could still prescribe locally and um, Jewish immigrant residents were used to this from Eastern Europe where you would go to an apotheker and so they preferred frequently it was less expensive to go to the pharmacist and get you know some advice about your condition than it was to pay a higher uh, doctor's fee. And in um, August 30th, 1897, only a couple of months after their founding, here we see in Yiddish, the headline says, Handlin with mention of Fleisch, meaning there's a trade in human or there's human trafficking. And then the uh, subheading, Hot unser Regierung das gewusst? Does our government know? And it's a story from San Francisco about trafficking in Chinese women and children. So the forward is mostly known for its long support of a strong labor movement, workers, union, workers' rights, especially garment workers. Uh, the forward covered and participated in demonstrations and marches on their behalf, such as this one shown here, initiated by most of the city's unions in the 1930s against the rise of fascism in Europe. And you can see on the placards uh, a drawing of Hitler, and over here is um, Mussolini, and that was over by um, Mad Madison Square Park. And um, just to push ahead a little bit, they covered uh, social justice issues, obviously, you know, the 1963 Civil Rights March on Washington and the ERA, um, all the way up through when foreign policy became more of the struggle for social justice for the forward, both on the Soviet and the Middle Eastern Front, that became pretty much the major uh, issue for the forward in support of the state of Israel and also Soviet Jewry. And the image we're looking at here was, um, this is Abba Iban, um, Israel's representative at the UN, one of those like rock star diplomat types. And this is Moshe Dayan, uh, famous Israeli general, also kind of a rock star in his day. Um, 
And the forward taught readers how to participate in local and national elections. And that was a big social justice issue for us. And it's an issue, obviously, we're still discussing today in this country. And I'm just going to um, close out with a couple of slides showing how the forward taught readers to vote. So this is um, how you say vote in Yiddish, stimmt. And it's interesting because the word stimme is actually your voice. So your vote. Your, and, and voice are very uh, similar. And here in the early 1900s, macht richtig euer Zeichen auf dem Ballot. Here the forward is teaching readers how to make, you know, in those days it was an X on the ballot. And then the copy underneath tells them, if you should happen to ruin your ballot, please know that it is your right to demand another one. So they wanted no one to feel bullied at the ballot box. And in those days, you know, voting took place in the saloons in New York. So it was kind of precarious. Um, and, um, you know, part of being a, a voting forward reader also meant you were encouraged and even cajoled to vote. So here we have a, a cartoon in English because it's the 1920s and the forward is aware that the readership is already, you know, the next generation is more English speakers. And so there, it's, it's a joke about sort of the, the older dad. He, he's really excited Excited to be an American. He's hanging up the poster of his guy who he's voting for for the campaign. He's super excited. And then mom comes out of the kitchen to, to go, well, well, did, did you go? Did you vote? And dad realizes he completely forgot to vote. So it's an early reminder to, um, you know, that your rights are, you know, to, to, to enact change forward readers are being taught that you have to participate and, and you have to vote. And part of how the forward encouraged that was that on election night, starting in the early 1900s, going all the way up to the 50s, folks were invited to come down to the forward building and hang out at Seward Park, which was across the street from 175 East Broadway, where on election night, the returns would be received by the forward and then projected um, you know, onto the outside of the building. It was a lot of fun. Um, I, you know, the, the head count is up to the tens of thousands and um, people, I, I've heard anecdotes, people remembering it in, in the 40s, especially with um, Roosevelt's um, last election, it was like a huge, and the war ending, it was just like a, a huge, big, extremely moving um, event. And um, here we have a little later, this is the 1936 Roosevelt Lehman ticket. You can see that, you know, it's already the, the ballot with the, um, the toggles no longer making an X and readers are explained actually how to use that mechanized voting system. And also to, they're asked to vote for these candidates using the ticket of the American Labor Party. And as far back as 1928, we have a breakdown for um, the readers about the Electoral College. This is from um, the 28 Hoover Smith um, elections. And then um, we, you know, as I said, the forward supported garment workers, and we had a great relationship with the union, the ILGWU, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. So this is from the 1960s already, where the, um, they're using a little bit of English copy, and it, it's a little controversial. They're asking uh, readers to vote twice, meaning in this election, go do your citizen's duty and vote, but on the second round, vote by purchasing garments with the union tag in them. And um, as far as the 1970s, this is from 1972, the forward also had a radio station called WEBD and listeners could hear election returns in Yiddish as, as late as 1972. And then local elections were equally part of the campaign on behalf of the forwards to encourage uh, readers to be active citizens. Here's an election in the 70s in the Bronx, Israel Rubin is running um, for a magistrate for judge. And I'm just gonna end with this image. This is uh, back in the 1920s. It's Hermoyne Pankin. She's the daughter of the first Jewish judge to be elected in the city to family court on the socialist ticket. And, you know, I'd like to think that past is prologue. Here's a young woman. She can now vote. She has the right to vote and she's actually campaigning. So um, thank you so much. So now we're going to have Yue, yeah, unmute yourself and um, great. Thanks so much. Take it away, Yue.
Okay, so good evening, everyone. Thanks for attending this program. I'm Yuema. I'm the Director of Collections and Research at the Museum of Chinese in America. I'm very excited to share Moga newspaper collections, and I hope you enjoy it. So uh, compared to the one newspaper with such a long history at uh, Forward Archives, Moga has a broader um, newspaper collections. Um, you can see the status. There are a lot of different newspapers in our collection, and they are um, either in English or in Chinese or bilingual. And they existed also in different time period. Some of them exist longer until today, and most of them uh, already seed and also um, stay. Some of them stay very short time. And um, I just want to. Uh, show you some examples of this collection. I may not be able to go to the details, but hopefully I prepare other slides during the discussing uh, section. I can show you more uh, on details from the um, newspapers. Uh, so I choose 14 newspapers and the image to show you what we have. Um, first is um, English, the newspaper in English. So the Chinese American Times run by uh, William Yu Kang Chu from 1955 to 1972. It's a monthly newspaper focused on life, culture, and the politics in Chinese community in New York City, particularly in Chinatown. And the Asian Week uh, was called um, Americans first and the largest English language print and online publication serving Asian Americans. It ran from 1979 and the print ceased on January 2nd, 2009, but the online publication still um, lasts until today. Um, so the next um, is um, East West. Um, this is a San Francisco Chinatown-based Chinese English bilingual newspaper founded by Gordon Law. He's also a professor at City College of San Francisco. Uh, the newspaper ran weekly from 1967 to 1989. And on the right side is called um, International Examiner. This is a free bi-weekly Asian American newspaper based on um, Seattle, Washington International District. It was found in 1974, and it mostly focused on the business interest of Asian American community in Seattle. But in 1975, the examiner was purchased by Alaska uh, Canary Workers Association for just $1, and then became an archivist, community-based newspaper until today. And the next is the next is called Jijar. It's a monthly newspaper magazine of Asian American experience. Uh, they shelf uh, proclaim themselves a voice of Asian American movement, run from 1969 to 1974. And the Wei Minbao on the right side is in Chinese and English. English in the front, Chinese in the back, also funded in San Francisco. It's a B-monthly newspaper start from 1971 to a, a year not certain, but definitely before 2000. Um, So the one on the left side is called China Daily News. Um, it's a newspaper in Chinese. So start from this one, uh, all newspaper in Chinese language uh, from 1940 to 1989. I prepare uh, some examples um, articles from this newspaper uh, to show you uh, in the next section. Uh, but here I would like to uh, share this newspaper is the uh, biggest uh, newspaper in Chinese in our collection. We have uh, above 2,000 issue of it. Um, and the, the first one in English called China, uh, Chinese American Times, uh, we have about 100 issues that's in English. Both newspapers are very unique uh, and precious in our collection. 
So the University of California in Berkeley, they used to look for uh, Chinese American time, the English one, all over the country and find we are the only ones still have a site. Uh, so uh, because of this, we um, here I would like to share a joint grant project between us and the Jewish uh, Center for Jewish History. Um, it's a grant supported by uh, CLEAR. Uh, it's um, can, uh, Council on Library and Information Resource. So it's helped us to digitize hand, hidden special collections and archives. So the Center for Jewish History used their unique uh, professionals and uh, state of arts equipment help us digitize uh, the newspaper for every page. So currently we um, convert the, the image and put them online. So by, uh, this is a three year grant project. So by 2020, three, we will have uh, this China Daily News and Chinese American Times four pages online. So this is the information I would really like to share over here. And on the right side, it's called Zhongxi Ribao. Uh, so it's a Chinese language newspaper uh, found by um, Wu Pan Zhao in San Francisco again, but it was from 1900 to 1951. So you can see this is uh, compared to other uh, newspaper, this is much earlier, start from 1900. Um, the next one I would like to share is um, from the right side and left side, you can see the English title for the newspaper uh, same. Uh, they both call um, Chinese nationalist, nationalist daily. So um, this is uh, found by Guomindang. Uh, it's also called Chinese Nationalist Party. Um, the left one was um, published in um, New York, and the Chinese title is different. It's called Minqi Ribao. Uh, it was um, inscribed by Wang Jingwei. And the right side is called Guomin Ribao. It's found in San Francisco. Uh, the Chinese title uh, was inscribed by uh, Jiang Kai shek um, I didn't find the time period from which year to which year, but the left side is 1937. The right side is 1941. And the content also about um, anti-Japanese war and the Chinese civil war. So it's uh, probably around that time period from 1930s to 1940s to 50s. Um, the next pair uh, also share The next pair also share um, the same uh, English name called the Chinese Journal. Uh, but this is the same uh, newspaper uh, funded in uh, New York. Um, so this newspaper actually uh, funded in 1929, and it was uh, weekly at the beginning and then changed to uh, every two days and then daily and then every three days until 1943. Uh, it was purchased by Chinese American World Publishing uh, Corporate. And then it changed the name from New Yue Shangbao to Major Ribao, but the Chinese, but the English name keep the same. And we have this United Journal. It was founded in 1952. And I'm not sure uh, when it lasts to, probably in 1990s. Um, and the right side is called Minzhi. Uh, Ribao is Minzhi Journal, but it exists very short from 1960 to 1966. Um, the organization's name is Chinese Freemasons. And we have this um, one box of um, uh, Chinese Pacific weeks. Uh, it's from 1946 to probably 1972. It's a weekly newspaper in Chinese. And the right side is called the Young China. It's fixed to young people, but it lasts very long, uh, founded in San Francisco from 1910 to 1985. Um, so that's, I can't show every newspaper in our collection, but that 14 examples. Um, and after that, I would like to share some 
um, photo collections um, in our collection to show um, how close relations uh, those newspapers in Chinese life uh, in American. Uh, so the first image you can see is from Michelle Adir's collection, and they show a man um, where, uh, you know, the shirts and tie and reading newspaper leaning on his car probably in 1930s uh, or 40s. And this one, uh, and these two photographs uh, taken by uh, Bab Glick, uh, you can see um, it's around 1980s. So the left one uh, showing a grandfather reading newspaper in his apartment uh, at Bayard Street with uh, his grandson, uh, his name Vincent Lee, uh, you know, sleeping um, uh, on, uh, like on her lap and when he read newspapers. And the right side showing uh, a man in Columbus Park um, on a bench reading newspapers. Um, and this uh, image from our basement workshop say, showing like two women talking to each other and one of them holding a Chinese newspaper. Uh, and this is a, a hair salon in, on uh, East Broadway. This photograph is taken by uh, Paul Cahu. Um, you can see the custom reading newspapers uh, when get haircut. Um, this is an image donated by Elizabeth Ng and uh, showing Rab Rabin Ng is holding a copy of Chinese Daily News as a newspaper boy. And this is a um, newsstand in Chinatown in 1980s, also taken by um, Paul Kahu and showing the newspaper uh, in the front, uh, English newspaper, Chinese newspaper, and a cigarette in the background. And the last image uh, show um, it, a, a recent, um, you know, during COVID-19, it's one of our um, one word uh, COVID-19 special uh, submission. Um, this picture taken on uh, May 27th, 2020 by um, Turfik uh, al Sawi uh, in front of the first Chinese Baptist church at 21 Pell Street. Um, so you can see those two people wear a uh, mask um, uh, in during this uh, special time period. So all those uh, photographs uh, show uh, how close um, the Chinese people, uh, the relations between Chinese people with those newspapers. Um, I think I'll um, stop here. And then uh, the next, I hope I can have a chance to show you details from mostly uh, Chinese um, Daily uh, China Daily News from that uh, collection, but there are a few from other collections. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Hannah. Come on back, unmute yourself. Hello. Um, you thank you yeah Beautiful. thank you both so much that was so so interesting and so much fun to just even look at the newspapers there's just the graphic look of them all it's just fascinating uh, especially to somebody like me who doesn't read yiddish or chinese um but anyway i thought um given what we just looked at we'd um talk, uh, do a little compare and contrast or whatever, talk about the similarities and the differences between the way these newspapers have functioned in their um, communities. So um, for both of you, like what do you, how do you think, what's the primary, the most important function of these newspapers in their communities? Um, that has it changed over time? Um, is the idea to acclimate um, immigrants or to preserve old traditions or what do you think the, the reason for them or their, their biggest function is? I know that's a lot. Just great, great <laughs> question. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll go. Uh, give you a, a chance to, to rest, to have a break for a second. Thank you. After that, <laughs> a tour de force. Um, 
I, I want to say check all boxes, like all of the above, but you're, you're so correct in sort of indicating that there's a historic trajectory. So totally true. Uh, in the beginning, 1897, they are directly working on several fronts. One, to acclimate people. Um, two, to um, engender citizenship, like to, to help foster a sense of what it could mean to be a hyphenated American, a Jewish American, and also to read back, to read the country they were now in, to read America back to the Jewish people, and then um, also to call on account, to speak truth to power, to, to mirror the good, the bad, and the, and the unjust, both in the Jewish community, but also out in the, in the in the world and in the American world, and you know, clearly for the forward in the world of work, in the world of labor. Um, and I think for the most part, that is still the case, but um, different immigrant groups coming through. And also at this point, there, there's a comfort level, there's you know, a financial uh, level that they've attained. So some of the issues are not the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, what would you say for the uh, Chinese community, Yue? Um, I think first I would like to quote uh, CUNY professor uh, uh, Charlotte uh, Brooks. Uh, she used to have a chance to introduce um, uh, William E. Kang Chong, who is the uh, chief editor of uh, Chinese American Times. So Bill said in a phone interview with uh, Professor Charlotte, he said New York's Chinese American community was pretty small at the time and not powerful uh, politically. He was determined to give the community a voice and something they could be proud of. And then her daughter also mentioned in the interview saying that it was one of the few English language newspaper in operation in 1950s and 60s that were aimed at multi-generational Chinese American readership. He wanted them to feel they were American yet still Chinese. So actually those, um, this is like the, the first English newspaper I show yeah, in the slideshow. Um, so uh, it's really, uh, you know, representable. Uh, the, the content covered international, you know, back home country and also local news um, and the multi-generation and also in English. So for the next generation who uh, were born here can also get um, the cover of those news. Um, all over uh, the world, actually, also locally in Chinatown. Um, certainly, the Chinese newspaper is more focused on uh, Chinese readers. Um, and also, if you uh, look at deeper uh, for the background, they were like, it's like the other one, the Nationalist Party's newspaper is more like from Taiwan and the run by um, Guomindang. And then there are other Chinese newspaper uh, focus on, uh, you know, different uh, background. So because China is so big with different dialect uh, and also different background from Taiwan and mainland China, uh, or even like Hong Kong, uh, Guangdong. So they focus on different news from the home country and also um, the local, like what um, Hannah already showed, the sport, entertainment, um, you know, restaurants, like all, all those daily life um, could be covered. So it sounds like they served a similar function in that publishing in English for, for the newspapers in both communities served a similar function to reach a, a next generation, but keep them connected with their heritage in a way. It, it yes. Like. Yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, you had different um, subjects that were covered. Um, Hannah talked a little bit about the the subjects that are the title of our mm -hmm. program tonight: um, activism, mm -hmm. athletics, and advice. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. You had said you had more stuff you wanted to share. Was does it connect to that or? Something? Yeah, I do have some examples uh, in my uh, slides uh, in the later page. Sure, if you we'd can, love to see it. Uh, yeah, Sophie, if you can share 
my slides for the later. Yeah, uh, so I can quickly. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so. Um, okay, so this one show. Um, let me see. Yeah, this one show uh, news on sport. So on the left side, it's it was most of the articles I pull out from the China Daily News, the Chinese newspaper, but only like two examples I got from others. So on the left side is from China Daily News, the Chinese newspaper in uh, on March 10th, 1977. It's um, the American College basketball champion was won by Marquette University uh, in that year. And the right side, it's not from China Daily News, but I thought it's very interesting. It's from uh, Chinese American Times, the English newspaper. Um, the group of um, uh, the Chinatown basketball team, we can see a familiar face. Uh, the one in the middle on the first line uh, was uh, Paul Gong Lee. We used to do uh, his exhibition. He did a lot of his architecture uh, in Chinatown. He designed uh, different uh, buildings in Chinatown as well as back in China uh, near uh, Shanghai, Nanjing area. And there were also um, James Taipong, uh, his family collection uh, was in our museum. And also um, there, uh, he's the one, I think who is he? he, he is the one in the back on the left. And also we have uh, this big name, um, Shevry Li, uh, who used to be called mayor of Chinatown. He's the one in the front uh, line uh, on the left. Um, so this is uh, the topic on support. And then um, this entertainment in 1977, again, on the same newspaper, March 30. Uh, this is not the same day. Uh, the last support is like March 10th. So it is when March 30th is, is Chinatown Youth Culture Center performance in Central Park on the left side. And on the right side, it's like general introduction to Beijing Opera. Uh, they both from uh, China Daily News. And this one in Chinese uh, talk about um, history of uh, Chop Shui. It's considered one of the two major earliest Chinese business restaurant. Um, and then this one I think is interesting. Uh, it's um, uh, Nobel uh, Prize winner uh, Li Zhengdao and Yang Zhengning. They both get a chance to go back to China in 1980. Uh, so they were in a conference on physics uh, in Chonghua, Guangdong, in, in Canton, China. Um, and this one, um, yeah, this one is uh, in 1980 on the left side, it's resident at 54 to 56 Henry Street, protest against um, uh, the owner who didn't provide uh, heat and, uh, you know, heating and hot water. And the, on the right side, it's from another newspaper, uh, it's from Asian Week. Um, so this is the second example from um, the other English newspaper rather than the Chinese uh, China Daily News in Chinese language. So it's um, about Asian Pacific American group stand up for uh, Maryland hate crime law. Um, yeah, and I think these two uh, articles uh, interested uh, were uh, from uh, China Daily News again. Uh, so it, it's uh, the, the top one was in 1941. On 1945, the, the lower one is in 1942. They both um, uh, talk, uh, the, the, the top one talk about the, uh, the Chinese Civil War and the, the lower one talk about the anti-Japanese war in China. Um, and then the next is also interesting to, it's, um, um, the it's on, on the right side. It's talk about the uh, 
uh, cultural revolution during that time, the high school students need to go to countryside uh, to spend you know, years and months in countryside rather than going to school. And then uh, the right side, um, it's after Cultural Revolution, talk about the Chinese uh, vice president, uh, vice cha chairman, I think it's called vice chairman, chairman Liu Shaoqi. Uh, first time his name can be um, on newspaper, listed with Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, and the other uh, name together. Um, and uh, yeah, and this is just like a general uh, uh, page of the newspaper. You can see it combine different, um, uh, I think, national uh, news all together. It's about sports and, you know, movie star, and also even um, the president uh, election. And the daily life on the top uh, left side is just like a, a sister called uh, the brother go back home. So it's like uh, six uh, general news all put all together. Um, and then this is um, a Chinese uh, advertisement page. And uh, what I would like to, this is a catch my eyes on the top uh, right side because we do have uh, this uh, print blog. Uh, in our collection, it's uh, a laundry um, print blog. Um, so I think that's the examples I would like to share with everybody. Thank you. Those were great. So cool. It was so much fun to look at. Um, the I know for the forward, the Binzel brief, the whole advice thing has been a big. Um, not necessarily a claim to fame, but something certainly that the forward's been known for for many, many years. Is that something that shows up in the Chinese language newspapers too, like a a place where people can write in with questions or something like that? Or is oh yeah, so uh, you can see our um, collections like range from this different years, mostly. Uh, almost mostly from 1970s, but they, they were they were earlier um, uh, examples. So in our collection, the earliest um, newspaper in Chinese was in 1897. I think I also have that page uh, in the slides to show if you can, yeah, share. Yeah, this one. So, um, so this one on the uh, left side is called uh, the Chinese American. It's a newspaper uh, founded by um, uh, Wang Qingfu. Wang Qingfu is a big name, uh, very famous uh, uh, Chinese American activist, journalist, lecturer, and the writer. Uh, so um, he found this newspaper in 1883. So uh, it's still handwriting. Uh, and, and then it's interesting to look at the name, the Chinese American, I think it's the first time to call ourselves Chinese American by Wang Qingfu in this newspaper. And also uh, you can see those uh, published year uh, in the middle is under the title of the newspaper was in Chinese. And then um, on the right side is the lunar year in Chinese. And on, uh, on the left side is the, the address of the public uh, pub publication. So it's located in um, uh, 189 to 191 uh, Cham Chamdam Street in Chinatown. And, uh, um, and uh, talking about how um, people, uh, you know, get the information from the earlier newspaper, on the right side uh, in our, um, image collection, you can see this is called Bugao Ban. It's a very popular way for Chinese people to get the news every day, uh, not only in America, but also back in China too. So there was a wall in the community. Um, people just know to go there to get every day's news and information posters, flyers, and newspapers, or all other announcement. It's called Bugao Ban. And um, uh, so, uh, so even at MOGA, we had this uh, MOGA newsletters published from 1984 to 2006. We also named it Bugao Ban. 
Uh, so in the first page, you can see the front page is also a, a image uh, to show uh, people uh, look at uh, the 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 Bugao band the wall to get news and announcement. Um, and the, even until um, the yeah, even until the September 11, uh, this picture was taken by Corky Lee in our September 11 collection. It show a, a memorial wall. Uh, it's also like the way of Bugao Ban at Madison Street uh, for newspaper flyers and um, all other uh, memorial uh, articles. Um, yeah, so that's the way uh, that's it's an interesting way of of communicating the news, and it's 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 particularly interesting that it it continues in various different ways. Um, yes. Hana, is that something that you ever see in the in the Jewish community or now? Right. Um, when I first saw them, um, it reminds me. I think this still goes on in um, the super insular, very very tightly knit uh, Orthodox um, communities mm, where they're called a kol koire. If they if the uh, the rabbi uh, wants to communicate something or the leader of the community wants to communicate something, um, they will still do like a wheat paste posters on the street, both in uh, parts of Jerusalem, I know, and also Brooklyn. So I'm familiar with it from there. And that definitely comes also, you know, in Eastern Europe, that's the tradition is to notify the community, they would do like a wheat paste of a, a typeset, you know, um, poster, street poster. Um, but I have to say, uh, what comes to mind for me just from being around the newspaper is that uh, you kind of wonder if they're giving the newspaper for free on the wall, <laughs> does that cut into subscriptions? What happens? Ah. What's, what's the... Anyways. Yeah, it's, yeah well, a, it's a good question. I guess it, it, it would, but still, yeah. people still subscribe. Yeah, um, cool. yeah. it's like it, it provides an extra way. Yeah. Uh, for people to get the news. And yeah. did you say, like, did it fade away, UA? Or is it something that's still, is it still a practice in the community? Like the, the first page will be up on the wall or? Uh, I, I think so. See, the September 11, uh, we yeah. still have those memorial wall. It's, it's cool. very much tradition, yeah. Wow. But people still buy newspapers, still subscribe, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We have um, a couple of questions from our audience members. So um, there's one for Yue. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, if, if any of our audience members still have questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A chat box. So Yue, as the linguistic profile of Chinese Americans shifted post-World War II from predominantly Toisanese speakers, including many paper sons, to those who spoke Cantonese, Mandarin, Min, and other dialects, how did that affect the cultural and political landscape of Chinese American newspapers? And you might want to define what Paper Sons means for um, some of our audience members. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, Paper Sun um, during uh, the Chinese Exclusion Acts, uh, so Chinese family um, uh, laborers, um, the workers, they they are prohibited from uh, entering American. Uh, so um, then, uh, I think that's after uh, the San Francisco earthquake. Um, the National Archives um, <laughs> paper got lost from the earthquake. Th then gave a chance for Chinese people claim. Um, their son, um, you know, their children in China to come to America to claim as their uh, descendants. So those people who use others' last name to claim someone's son called paper son. Uh, but mostly those people from Taishan, because a lot of Taishanese work here during, before uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act. So a lot of Taiwanese, uh, they brought others uh, song as their song, this paper song to come to America. Um, so I think um, this, uh, this is a very good question. I think I already uh, kind of um, mentioned uh, a little bit about um, 
uh, you know, the Chinese newspaper for uh, different background people so that the focus will be different. But here I would like to clarify uh, the Cantonese Mandarin or, you know, Minanhua, like what, um, uh, the, you know, the Fujian the Taiwanese speak. Uh, in writing, they're all similar. Uh, it's in Chinese, it's only like traditional Chinese or simplified Chinese. Uh, so they can read, even though they speak different dialects, they can still read. But I think maybe people from Taiwan would like to go towards the Taiwan background newspaper more than mainland, but still it's shared. So they still can read the news from uh, other place like mainland Chinese. Um, uh, newspapers to share the news. Um, I so yeah. in that in that photograph that we showed earlier, where um, you you see the the Chinese newspapers on the walls, what what time period is that from for people to to get an idea? I I think those mostly from nineteen. I saw a few uh, pictures in our collection. Uh, it should be before 1930s or 40s, I would this like to the, say. Um, this is the Bugaoban. Yeah, the Bugaoban. I, I think the, the main place was in front of uh, the CCBA, the current CCBA building. Yeah, I saw a picture of that. Yeah, it, it, it's mostly during 1930s. And Hannah, what's what's in, in, in your archive? What is the, the oldest uh, newspaper that you still have? In your archives. Oh, uh, well, um, actually, everything I showed tonight, I gathered off our our back issues. We don't we don't hold our back issues in hard copy. It's you know newspaper kind of crumbles. I'm sure UA can can tell you about that. <laughs> and so um, they're digitized. The run is like from 1897 up to 1979 right now on um, online in a collaboration with the National Library of Israel and it's open to the public and it's online and um, it's available for research that way. And otherwise they're available on microfilm. Um, like UA mentioned at the Center for Jewish History has a copy, the New York Public Library has a copy and major research facilities around um, the country, around the world, uh, tend to have a copy, a run of the forward on microfilm, but the, the tendency is to want to, you know, look at it digitally. It's, it's got OCR, so it has like a search function. It's not great, but you can research in English and in Yiddish. So that, that's been really indispensable for me. When I first came on, it was like microfilm and making Xerox copies. So this is, this is great. <laughs> They're searchable in both Yiddish and English. Yes. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not our, early, uh, but our... it's it's a good start. It's a really strong start. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So yeah. so it, sorry, just to, like in terms of like the oldest, um, I have some bound. We we had an associate editor for a while who's a folklorist, um, professor, it's a goddessman, and um he collected off of eBay. Like you find a lot of our bound issues. And it's not, it won't be a full run, but I have a couple of bound issues. And I think the earliest is like 1913, maybe 1920. But they're very um, you know, the acid of the newspaper just kind of makes them in Yiddish, we would say crystal. Crucially, you know, you can you can get it. They're just like kind of crumbly, so you have to be really careful, you know, turning the pages. And, yeah. Um, we have another question. Someone said, after the turn of the century, I think my Chinese grandfather found laundry men who needed someone to take over their business while they went back to China. Um, did the newspapers have classified ads for the local community? And I think this is a question for both Yue and Hana. Uh, yeah, I, I think the other uh, page I show the advertisement, they were like a hand laundry uh, advertisement there, mostly uh, in Chinese, even in English newspaper, it could be in Chinese for mm. advertisement. Wow. Uh, we definitely had classifieds. Um, it varied. Um, in the in the beginning, the classifieds, just like what we're talking about here, it, it sort of was a, a twist between you know, looking for missing people, sometimes with a little photograph, have you seen my relative, things like that, definitely about jobs. And it is very interesting to, to read in the beginning, you know, there 
the classifieds are divided by gender, I'm sure, you know, uh, jobs for women, jobs for men, you know, they were like completely divided. And then there was also real estate by us, like there was a, a movement to encourage people to leave the urban center and that, you know, you could get a farm, you know, so there were things like that. There were businesses, delis being sold, just, you know, um, lots of stuff like that, but it definitely included, um, uh, you know, missing person type things, you know, looking for individuals and opportunities. And just to run up to the war, to World War II, in the run up to it was also, you know, I'm looking for so and so. I heard I have a relative on the Upper West Side, you know, is that, you know, do, do you, are you familiar with them in the hopes that somebody would help them emigrate before the war? And, um, and then after the war, we ran tons of, you know, I am so and so and I survived from from this particular town, um, do you know anything about um, my relatives? Like sort of the, the same seeking missing people basically is what I'm trying to say. And family reunification happened a lot through the forward. And, and it's actually, you know, they're so small, right? So it's a little bit difficult to, to find that for people, but it, it does seem to be something that um, people are looking for now in newspapers in particular. And the Guardian just ran this amazing story uh, last week about they, they picked up on some of the classifieds from um, uh, Jewish people in Vienna who were trying to get over to England before it was too late in World War II. And they were offering like, would you wanna take my child? This is like in the thirties, the late thirties. Would you want my child? They'll make a great houseboy. They'll make a great butler. Can I come and work for you? I speak some English. So they actually traced them back. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I guess that's kind of like a, the what people would did with with paper sons right yeah um, it's exactly that story yeah yeah wow so many parallels um i mean what what i still find really incredible is that these two communities are are living so closely together right right around the same time um trying to to teach their their new immigrants or maybe second, third generation Americans how to be Americans while still preserving their core identity, some aspects of their culture. Um, I mean, for the both of you having joined us in this program, hopefully having learned a little bit more about um, both the Yiddish speaking community and the Chinese speaking communities. I mean, for Yue, Hannah and Nancy, I mean, what, what what do you think was surprising and what is your greatest takeaway um, from learning about these, these different newspapers and about the people who would read them? Yeah. I, I guess for me, it's that there, there's so many similarities, which shouldn't be surprising, but it's still, it's fun to see. Um, one thing that I was kind of curious about was if there was a crossover between the two communities, you know, if the forward looked at the Chinese community and if the, the Chinese newspapers looked at the Jewish community. And, you know, I, Ahana showed um, an article that indicates that there was, that was, I guess, more of a political thing out in the world than right in the community, but, um, that would be interesting and probably very hard to figure out um, without all kinds of crazy indexes and things. <laughs> but it would be interesting to see if they, you know, how aware these communities were of each other and how they might have interacted. Yeah, um, I definitely did just like a little uh, search in and I found quite a bit, like especially let's say in the 60s and 70s when the garment industry is is shifting and um, Asian immigration is coming in and, and peopling that field. There was definitely a couple of articles about um, hearing um, Chinese spoken at union meetings, right? Which is just the same as they used to say, you know, hearing Yiddish spoken at union meetings. And um, I was also thinking about, there was a writer for us in the, uh, he managed to get out of Europe and, and come and get a position uh, right on the cusp of the war, but he had spent time in um, Tianjin and Harbin, and his mm -hmm. name was um, Lazar Epstein. And so he came you know, to the United States and immigrated here and saved himself, but his son, Israel Epstein, actually stayed in China 
and became a correspondent. And actually, it's it's like a long, crazy story. He was imprisoned, you know, for 10 years, but he he actually became a member of the Chinese Communist Party and he 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 never came to no interest in coming to America. Like he he really believed in the revolution and he stayed and he was um a profound, he was a journalist there, he married into um the Chinese um community and um he just died like recently this um yeah, so I thought that was like a tremendous, crazy, forward yeah. adjacent story, like yeah. all the way. Yeah. <laughs> and wow. then I'll just, you know, the, the little, you know, 1936, we definitely started ad receiving advertisements from Chinese restaurants for our readership, um, wishing, um, you know, a happy new year, like September time for Rosh Hashanah, wishing a, a sweet new year to the Jewish clientele, you know, so that, that's a more typical thing that we think about. But um, mm -hmm. there, there, I mean, and, and those are just like, you know, little bits that I saw and, and I'm sure I, I believe there, there's 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 stuff there to mine mm -hmm. for another program yeah. and I just just want to sorry just say for me you ain't uh, see how many newspapers there were just mind-blowing it is mind-blowing and actually that yeah. leads to That's someone someone's question for us someone said one thing that is not parallel is that there is one forward but <laughs> lots and lots of different Chinese newspapers so yeah. why do we think that happened. And mm. they said, I understand why there were several after 1949 when politics dictated that that would be the case. But what about before then? Wait, yeah, wait. that's a really good question. I think we uh, often, yeah, the, the two communities so um, close to each other, like what you talk about, the people go to Shanghai. I think they're Jewish people definitely went to Shanghai during that time period. Uh, and the, but, but the two community often actually, um, you know, run business or function, function dif differently. I guess I, it sounds to me mostly because of the fundings, like who support the newspaper. Usually I saw um, the, the editor just run by himself. It, it's really like for Chinese newspaper, I think it, it should be really hard. Uh, but if it's like supported by the whole community or I, I saw the uh, Chinese hand laundry islands used to support one um, newspaper, but, but it's really about, I, I feel like if the whole community kind of doing one newspaper, it will be last longer, but if just one person, I saw the William Yu Kang Chu, uh, he stopped China, uh, Chinese American time just because he retired. Uh, so that's kind of the reason I, I, I have a feeling like, and, and there are like several, because China is so big, like we talk about from different area, and there are already a, like newspaper in English, Chinese, bilingual exist. So it's really like kind of um, um, parallels are already there. So it that that kind of causes a different. Um, Hannah, when did when did the forward start publishing in English? Oh, over close to twenty years ago. And uh, there was a Russian edition too for a while, but that sort of didn't take root and um, we ended up with where we are now with the English and the, the Yiddish, but the, the English I would say is the dominant, but the Yiddish is what we're committed to historically and also has a profound, very strong readership and people look to the Yiddish forward for many things, um, including what we were talking about with different dialects. So for um, standardization of words, new, new vocabulary coming out in the digital mm -hmm. era, like they, they definitely look to the forward for that. Um, so it was still predominantly in Yiddish only up until yes. the early 2000s, late 1990s, late 1990s. But, um, wow. I should say that they, a couple of things, one, in order to do that, if we're talking about money, they had to sell their building to survive. They had to stop being a daily. They changed, like, you know, you'll probably notice while you're processing the newspapers, different shapes for a newspaper. You change your shape, you save money, <laughs> you know, less ink uh, and um, less writers. And um, so those, are, and they have the radio station. So those are like, it's, it's true. And it was a community thing and it's true all around us. Like East Broadway was Yiddish newspaper row. There were at least three, four other papers and there was a whole Yiddish publishing industry around the papers of, of, of books. 
So, you know, most famously Isaac Bashev Singer, right, who went on to win the Nobel Prize for the forward. So there was an entire thing, but there's no underestimating when you want to talk about the forward, when you want to talk about Yiddish, when you want to talk about Jewish press, there's no, I mean, but specifically Yiddish press, there's no underestimating the effect of the Holocaust and the reverberations of the loss of 6 million Yiddish speakers, <laughs> you know, or, yeah. And also, also, the power of America. It's going to be interesting to see how many Chinese newspapers can keep publishing, right? Because the, the influence of America on everybody's uh, culture is very powerful, very powerful. So it remains to be seen how many, you know, we're seeing a revival with Yiddish, but it's true. We're the last um, Yiddish paper uh, internationally too. Um, Israel's papers no longer publish in Yiddish. So, so it remains to be seen what the future Wow. And I, I have just one more question to follow up on that. So historically, these newspapers were, were very, very important in, in helping people get answers for advice, right? Um, helping them assimilate um, in this new country, teaching them how to be American, learning about basketball and baseball and other types of games. So today, I mean, what now that now that so many of these newspapers are are established, what function? I mean, how do you think its function has evolved? You know, has it changed? Is it still the same? Does it still offer advice on how to be American? Um, or you know, what what does it do? We're such a global economy now, right? right. Um, I can sit at home and watch the news and listen to the radio from any country that I that I want to, just stream yeah. it online. What do you think these newspapers, yeah, yeah. do now? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I like to believe I, I do believe this uh, for the forward that there's still uh, public service. There's still a great public service, whether that is for newer groups coming in or whether that is um, in terms of explaining how uh, the different ideologies are now being expressed in this country, you know, in the last um, couple of years, that's been a real important function for the paper, a safe harbor, right? Um, no matter what your political view is, th this is your, let's say, uh, community of origin, or this is a community that offers you uh, comfort, whether it's, you know, in recipes and video cooking shows in Yiddish that we do, or whether it's, um, you know, interviews that are done in the, the way only the forward can do that kind of interview. So, so you may read the same topic or the same individual being interviewed by the New York Times, but you're gonna see a real different interview when it's done by the forward. And I think that is still 124 years later, we're still you know, an intimate, uh, almost familial um, Jewish voice. So I think that's still, you know, e even with the, the, the digital, you know, like you said, you, you know, you can listen to news or read newspaper from anywhere in the world. So it's, it's this intense kind of competition, but at the same time, I think it is kind of a unique flavor, let's say. And, you know, no doubt that's also right. The, the, the papers that come out of New York City have a particular um, journalistic kind of legacy that they, they bear. And some of that is about the city and it is about immigration and how we all kind of jumble around and mix in the city. And, you know, I think that that also is kind of part of it, part of the legacy. Yeah, looking at our uh, first newspaper, like written in Chinese in 1883, uh, but the three articles you can see it's really like a rumor. It's talking about, you know, the, the empire court got a gift from other country and then, uh, you know, the governor got killed and then they killed the, uh, the elephant. I the, the gift. So it sounds like those kind of news, like a rumor. But now, you know, the, the social media, that all, all the news kind of, is, you know, it's pretty so, so fast. So then in the newspaper, I, I think it's really like, like the newest news and like internationally and also like in different, I, I think the current Chinese newspaper, they have uh, sections like international news, like uh, uh, China news and the local news and then other advertisement and, uh, and about life, about sports, there are different sections. It, it definitely changed after years. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for um, 
giving us this wonderful glimpse of, of how people share information together and how people create community together. Um, I, to our audience members, thank you for being here with us. I encourage you to check out the Forwards website. Um, also take a look at the Museum of Chinese in America's website too. Check out MOCA's collection too. Um, and we are open Janu uh, June, January, June 1st. So please come back if you haven't seen the exhibit yet, pressed. Um, it'll be great to have you have you back. We are free, free admission uh, all throughout June. So please come then. And Nancy, Hana, Yue, thank you so much. And I hope you'll have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye. <laughs>